So this chapter is about photosynthesis. And photosynthesis means the synthesis of organic compounds, carbon-containing compounds, from inorganic carbon compounds, which means carbon dioxide. And photo refers to light. Light energy will be transferred and transformed into the bonds of organic compounds like glucose. So in the ecosystem, sunlight comes in. That's the main form of energy. It first goes to the producers, which are the photosynthetic organisms, plants, and there are some photosynthetic bacteria and protists and algae, but plants being the main photosynthetic organism that would come to your mind. And the energy from sunlight is transferred and transformed into the bonds of glucose. So where it says sugars are made, they're made from carbon dioxide, and then the sunlight energy is going to form in the bonds, going to be in the bonds of the sugars. Oxygen is released as a waste product, and water is required as a reactant as well. So we have this summary equation of photosynthesis, which you should memorize. On the reactant side, on the left, you see the carbon dioxide and the water and the sunlight. I would really put that on the reactant side. And then the arrow is all the breaking and making of bonds. So it's going to be many, many steps. But ultimately, you get sugar, which represents the organic compound, which is the product of this whole process. And then oxygen is a waste product. So the chloroplast in a eukaryotic cell will be the organelle that serves as the location for photosynthesis. There are slightly um, different structures in, uh, there are different structures in bacteria, for example, that, that are able to do photosynthesis. But we're going to focus on the chloroplast in a eukaryotic cell. And the chloroplast has three types of membranes. The membranes themselves aren't different, but three, I guess, layers of membranes. The outer membrane, which is nice and smooth. The inner membrane, which is also nice and smooth. And then they've done kind of a cutaway in this picture. So you can see in the compartment inside the inner membrane, there is yet another level of membranes. And these are called the thylakoids or the thylakoid discs. And there are many of them stacked up. And you can see the thylakoid discs, and they've cut through some of those. And you can see in this picture it's pink or red. There's a space inside of each of those discs. So we have three membrane types, the outer membrane, the inner membrane, and then the thylakoid membranes. And the thylakoid membranes form these disc shapes. And inside there, there's a space called the thylakoid lumen. Outside of the thylakoid discs, but inside the inner membrane, is called the stroma. And then there is a space in between the outer and inner membrane, which is called the intermembrane space. But in photosynthesis, the most important locations are going to be the thylakoid membrane, themselves, and then the space outside, immediately outside the thylakoid membrane, which is called the stroma, and the space enclosed by the thylakoid membranes, which is called the thylakoid lumen, or just thylakoid space. So three levels, or three kinds of membranes, and three different spaces. So make sure you memorize and are able to label on an image like this the three membranes and the three spaces. There are two 
stages of photosynthesis, and if you've studied cellular respiration already, you may recall there are more than two stages of that. So this may seem like it's a little easier, and we are going to handle it in a pretty sim simple um, coverage of this topic. So two, two main stages of photosynthesis. They have, the names are light dependent reactions, or sometimes we just call them the light reactions. And then the second stage is called, they're called the carbon fixation reactions. We also call them the Calvin cycle. We also sometimes call them the dark reactions because they don't require light, although they can occur in light, but they don't require it. Sometimes we call them the Calvin-Benson cycle. And so there are several names. Sometimes we call them the light independent reactions. So there's actually several names for this second stage of photosynthesis. Um, but the names I will use will be the carbon fixation reactions or the Calvin cycle. So that's why I listed those names here. Um, okay, so the light dependent reactions or the light reactions those require light. We're talking about sunlight, although you can get some bulbs that imitate or have the same types of energy as sunlight, but sunlight basically. And that the, the entirety of the light dependent reactions, um, the purpose of it is to make ATP. Of course, we make ATP from ADP and inorganic phosphate. And we're also going to make NADPH, and we make NADPH from NADP+. So that may not seem too um, strange, uh, similar to some of the things we've seen in uh, cellular respiration, and we'll kind of come back, circle back to those. And then in the carbon fixation reactions, these reactions don't involve light. They um, use the ATP and the NADPH that were made during the light dependent reactions. They use those as reactants and ultimately synthesize organic molecules like glucose from CO2. So in the carbon fixation reactions, the reactants are going to be CO2, and then ATP and NADPH, which were produced in the light reactions. So here's a picture showing everything I was just saying. So in this picture, you're looking at a kind of diagram of the chloroplast. You can see the outer membrane is depicted with this kind of brown color. The inner membrane is green in this picture, although it's not truly green. And then you have the space inside the inner membrane is called the stroma. And then they're showing one little stack of thylakoid discs, although there would be many of these, but one stack anyway. And so, and they're not showing, but on the inside of the thylakoid discs would be the thylakoid space. So the thylakoid membrane is really where the light dependent reactions is going to happen. And you're going to have water is going to be a reactant. Oxygen is going to be a product. And also a reactant will be ADP plus PI plus NADP plus. And a product will be ATP plus NADPH. And we haven't put any numbers to it, but you can see kind of what's coming in and what's coming out. Anything going into the thylakoid discs in this picture are going to be reactants for the light dependent reactions. And the arrows coming out of the thylakoid discs represent things that are products of the light dependent reactions. So the other half of the picture is titled the Calvin cycle. So also in the chloroplast, but really just in the stroma portion of the chloroplast, you have the Calvin cycle. And similarly, any arrow that goes in, in this case CO2 is going into the Calvin cycle, that's going to be a reactant. And also the ATP and the NADPH is going in. And what you get out 
of the Calvin cycle are molecules called GA3P. And GA3P is equivalent to half of a sugar, half of a glucose. So if you have two GA3Ps, then those make up the equivalent of one glucose. And the other thing that comes off of the Calvin cycle as a product would be ADP plus inorganic phosphate, PI, plus NADP+. Plus. All right, so basically the ADP plus PI plus NADP+, plus gets converted to ATP and NADPH during the light reactions, and then it gets broken down again during the Calvin cycle. So those molecules are just serving a purpose in between these two stages. So we're going to start from the beginning really and look at the light reactions and then look at the Calvin cycle. All right. And the light reactions require sunlight and sunlight has properties of uh, any kind of um, radiation which means it travels in waves. So all energy travels in waves and we say that the wavelength of any type of energy is a way of distinguishing different kinds of energy. So wavelength is a is a measure when light travels in waves or any kind of radiation travels in waves you can measure the distance from the top of the wave to the top of the next wave and that's called the wavelength. You could also measure from the bottom of the wave to the bottom of the next wave. But that wavelength is distinct for any specific kind of radiation. And so in, in the universe we have different uh, types of radiation and they have different wavelengths and they fall along what we call the electromagnetic spectrum. So this is all the different kinds of radiation that exist or that we know of in the universe I would say. And on the right side of this image you see the radio waves. They have very long wavelengths the distance from the top of one wave to the top of the next wave is longer. Um, but as the wavelengths get smaller, you, you kind of cross over into different types of radiation. So infrared waves are have a smaller wavelength than radio waves. And then squooshed in here is the visible light. That's what you can actually see. Everything else is invisible. And then with a smaller wavelength than visible light would be UV rays, X-rays, and then all the way down to gamma rays. And so the only thing we can actually see with our eye is in this pretty narrow range of wavelengths called the visible light. And if we expand that, we can see visible light comes in different colors. We call them the colors of the rainbow. So red, orange, yellow, green, blue, violet. All right, and sometimes this combined together we call it white light, but sunlight contains all of these waves, not just the visible but also the invisible. Um, but it turns out that the wavelengths that the uh, photosynthesis, the pigments of photosynthesis, are going to absorb are typically are going to be, or they are going to be in the visible light range. So that's kind of interesting. So red has the longest wavelength, orange is a little shorter, yellow is a little shorter, and so on down to violet, which doesn't really matter. But um, it turns out that the pigments uh, that can do photosynthesis tend to absorb the energy of the red and the orange wavelengths, and they also tend to absorb the blue and the violet wavelengths. And the pigments don't absorb the green and the yellow which is kind of interesting because you think that plants, you know, most plants are green. That's what your eye sees. But in fact, that's the light that the pigment does not absorb. So it bounces back to your eye. And so what you're seeing is the only color of light that the plant does not use. So the plant is using the red and the orange wavelengths. It's using the 
uh, blue and the purple wavelengths, and it's not using the green or the yellow. And um, but it can use um, the red and the orange and the the blue and the purple, and so the the chloroplast can absorb that light energy. So pigments are molecules that absorb light energy, like I said, and most plants will absorb well um, in the red orange and in the blue violet range. Light um, not only travels in waves, it also travels or it also has characteristics of a particle of energy. So when we talk about light, when we're talking about the, the aspects of light that are like a wave, we talk about wavelength, but we also talk about particles of light and we call those photons. Photons are little packets of energy. So, so you can think of the light hitting the pigment either as like a wave or as a packet, but typically when we are talking about photosynthesis, we think about the photons hitting or being absorbed, the energy of the photon being absorbed by the pigment. When a photon hits anything, the energy of the photon, so we're talking about sunlight, when it hits something, either the energy is converted to heat, which happens to most surfaces uh, in, in summer when, when photons from the sun hit those surfaces, they get hot. Um, but if there are pigments in the, in the surface, then some of the energy can be absorbed by the pigments. And so really the only parts of the earth that absorb or use the sunlight would be parts where there's pigments um, and photosynthetic pigments being the ones that really can utilize that energy. The heat is just really a waste. So everywhere there's a surface that doesn't have pigments that are capturing that light energy, that energy is just being wasted. So think about that in terms of how much energy is being wasted that maybe we could somehow capture and use, maybe not for photosynthesis, but maybe for generating energy for life, for our work, you know, running our air conditioning and such. So there's so much opportunity for solar energy um, to be developed but I digress. All right, so like I said, there are pigments that absorb, and this picture on the left, you see the actual molecular structure of the pigments. You don't need to memorize these, but one thing you will notice is they have this hydrocarbon tail. Let's see, let me get a pen. See this hydrocarbon tail? That part will be inserted into the thylakoid membrane. That's what holds these in the membrane. And then they have this other section, um, especially for chlorophyll, which is letter A. This part here is called the porphyrin, and that part sits sort of on top of the membrane. That's the part that actually absorbs the light, and then it's anchored into the membrane by this hydrocarbon tail over here. So the pigments, when you shine light on them, sunlight, they absorb, absorption is on the y-axis here, they absorb the light, you can kind of see it in the blue and even crossing over into kind of the blue-green range, but they bottom out in the kind of green-yellow range. And then you get a little more absorption over in the red-orange range. So more or less, like I said before. So there are these little groupings on, on, uh, on the surface of the membrane of the chloroplast there are these little groupings and they're called photosystems. And really a photosystem is just a grouping of these pigment molecules. Remember, their hydrophobic tails are down in the membrane and then their porphyrin section is on the top. So there's all these pigments in this group. Well, one of the groups is called the light harvesting complex, uh, also called the antenna complex. Um, it's a group of pigments that any of them can be hit by photons and they absorb those photons but then they pass the photon on to the next to the nearby pigments and that continues until the photons are passed to what's called the reaction center and the reaction center would be two specific chlorophyll molecules 
the light harvesting complex or antenna complex can be chlorophyll, but there can be other pigments there too. But the reaction center are chlorophyll molecules that are special, and all of the photons that hit anywhere in that complex are passed to those special chlorophyll molecules. So you can think of the chlorophyll molecules kind of being in the center. Um, they're the ones that are receiving all of the um, photons that hit anywhere in the group. All right, so here's a picture, kind of a uh, some artist's imagination of how this might look. Uh, like It's hard to get a picture of these things, but you can imagine here's the thylakoid membrane right here. And you have all these pigments that are shown here as just green dots. So these are the top part of the pigment molecules, and then you can imagine the hydrophobic tails coming down into the membrane a little bit. But anyway, uh, a photon of light hits anywhere, and you see that it gets passed on until it reaches the reaction center. So over here, a photon of light down here hits this one, and it gets passed till it reaches the reaction center. So it doesn't matter where the photon hits. If it hits any of the pigments in that particular group, in that photosystem, then it'll get passed on. Now, you don't just have one photosystem on the thylakoid membrane. You have one here, and you have one right here, and another one right here, and so they're all over the place. So no matter where a photon hits, it's going to hit one of uh, the, the photosystems. And so the, um, the energy is passed on till it gets to the reaction center. All right. Now why? Well, the energy of the photon is going to be combined with some electrons. So you have electrons. And yes, they're coming from water, but we'll get to that in a minute. The electrons combined with the energy of the photon makes high-energy electrons. And this is not a new concept. High-energy electrons, you'll remember from cellular respiration, high-energy electrons are what are passed down the electron transport chain. And do you remember that the electron transport chain takes energy from those high-energy electrons as it passes the electrons along the chain, it also takes energy from them to pump hydrogens across the membrane. It's exactly what's happening here. The electrons are going to be combined with the energy from the light photon, and that makes them high energy electrons. And then in the next picture, those high energy electrons are going to be passed along the thylakoid membrane, along an electron transport chain. And that's going to, they're going to lose their energy as they get passed along the electron transport chain. And the energy that's taken from them is being used to pump hydrogen ions across the membrane. All right, so this is what happens. A photon of light is captured by a pigment. It's, the light energy is transferred to the reaction center. And it's combined with an electron to make a high energy electron. And it's going to be passed through an electron transport chain. And ultimately, that's going to be pumping hydrogen ions across the membrane to create a gradient. And then the gradient is released when ATP synthase opens, and the hydrogen ions diffuse back through. And it spins the turbine, and it makes the ATP molecules. Um, the other thing that happens is the electrons when, that will get picked up by NADP+, and that makes NADPH. So here's the whole picture of what's going on. And you really want to break it down step by step and then practice it until you can say it without looking. All right, so the light energy over here, the light hits the photosystem chlorophylls and gets passed to the reaction center. The reaction center combines that energy with electrons and passes those down the, down the electron transport chain. The electron transport chain proteins are pumping hydrogen ions across the membrane. All right. Now, the buildup of hydrogen ions in, inside, now this is going to be inside the thylakoid disc. That's where you're going to have a high concentration of hydrogen ions. 
when ATP synthase opens, the hydrogen ions diffuse out of the thylakoid space into the stroma, and that makes ATP. So that should sound somewhat familiar, uh, at least parts of it. In this case, the electrons are coming from a water molecule. So water provides the electrons, and sunlight provides the energy. And those two things are combined at the reaction center. And the energy is used to pump hydrogens across the membrane. The electrons, when they get here, these are low energy electrons now. And so what's going to happen is they get picked up by another reaction center and they get re-energized by another photon and they get passed down again, down another series of proteins, and ultimately they get picked up by NADP+, which becomes NADPH. Just like NAD+, was an electron carrier without any electrons, when uh, NADP plus, it's very similar, when it picks up electrons, it becomes NADPH. Sometimes students can remember this. Of course, the P is a phosphate, but you can remember P as being photo, some students think of P as being the one involved with photosynthesis. So NADH is the one involved with cellular respiration, and NADPH is the one involved with photosynthesis, but they're both electron carriers in the same sense. So ultimately, what we've seen is water's been used, water's a reactant, sunlight is a reactant, and ADP is a reactant, and NADP plus is a reactant. And what you produce is Oxygen is a waste product, so that's a product. NADPH is a product. ATP is a product. So what's the point of all this? Well, you need the ATP and you need the NADPH for the next phase. So the light reactions is really just a means of generating the ATP and the NADPH that's needed for the next phase. So the next phase is the Calvin cycle, all right? So here we kind of zoom out, and now we're looking not only at sort of one thylakoid disc here, extremely enlarged within the entirety of the um, chloroplast, but then now we have the Calvin cycle over here. So we made NADPH in the light-dependent reactions, and we made ATP. We also made some oxygen, but that was just a waste. Uh, when we split the water to get the electrons out of the water, it just makes uh, oxygen. But the ATP and the NADPH, which are pro yeah, products of the light reactions, are going to be reactants for the Calvin cycle. So you can see in the Calvin cycle, ATP is needed here, ATP is needed here, NADPH is needed here. And what really what's happening here is carbon dioxide is being brought in and using the energy from ATP and using the electrons from NADPH, it's being converted into an organic compound, which is sugar. I mean, that's ultimately what we're creating here, what's being synthesized. So the Calvin cycle was named after Melvin Calvin. And the first step of the um, Calvin cycle is the attachment of CO2, which comes from the atmosphere, which comes from the air, to a molecule called Ruby P. Now Ruby P is an acronym. It stands for ribulose bisphosphate. And ribulose is a five carbon sugar and similar to ribose, but it's called ribulose. And when you attach one carbon dioxide to a five carbon sugar, you get a six carbon sugar, but that six carbon sugar immediately splits apart into three carbon sugars. And so that, that first step 
That's really the most important step of the Calvin cycle. It's the first step, the attachment of CO2 to ruby P, ribulose bisphosphate. The enzyme that does that attachment is called Rubisco, which also is an acronym. The long name is ribulose bisphosphate, bisphosphate carboxylase, phosphate carboxylase oxidase, I'm sorry, ribulose bisphosphate carboxylase oxidase. Well, don't worry about it, Rubisco. And um, that enzyme is really important, all right? So we will be talking about that a little bit. Um, the ATP and the NADPH, which you'll remember were the products of the light reactions, are now going to be used in the Calvin cycle. So this is detailed, but we're really not going to go into the details too much. Um, we usually think about the Calvin cycle in threes, like we multiply everything by three. Uh, if you start with three molecules of CO2 and three molecules of Ruby P, all right, then you can make three six carbon molecules. And Rubisco is the name of the enzyme, so that you, need to, you do need to know. But those three, six carbon molecules immediately splits into six three carbon molecules. And then ATP is needed, NADPH is needed, and ultimately you end up with these three carbon sugars being made, three carbon sugars here, all right? A three carbon sugar is half of a glucose. But if if we got here, if we had six molecules here of three carbon sugar, we can't take all of them. If we took away all of the three carbon sugars from this, then the cycle would be done. It wouldn't be a cycle. A cycle means that you start with and end with something. Not Maybe not everything in the cycle is regenerated, but something is. So you may remember from cellular respiration and the Krebs cycle, the TCA cycle, there was a molecule called oxaloacetate, which was in, you know, it was there in the beginning to join with the acetyl-CoA, and then it gets regenerated by the end. You still have another oxaloacetate so that it can join with another acetyl-CoA and keep going. So in the same way, the Calvin cycle, you have to start with Ruby P, but you also have to leave enough molecules stay in the cycle that you can regenerate the Ruby P so that you have it for the next turn of the cycle. And so what's going to happen here is the three molecules of CO2 that join with the three molecules of Ruby P by the enzyme called Rubisco, ultimately you end only, you can only take off a profit of one three carbon sugar. The other three carbon sugars, the other five molecules, are needed to regenerate the Ruby P. So for every three molecules of CO2 that come into the Calvin cycle, you get a half a molecule of glucose. You get a three carbon sugar. So that means for every six molecules of CO2 that go through the Calvin cycle, you would get the equivalent of one full glucose molecule. So really, um, glucose is not directly made by the Calvin cycle. Half of a glucose is made. So GA3P uh, stands for glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. But glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate is a 3-carbon sugar. And as soon as you have two of those, then the cell can join them in one extra step to make glucose, to make fructose, to make um, any of those six carbon sugars. And from there, then the cell can then join together those monosaccharides and make polysaccharides. We're not going to delve into this, but an enzyme like Rubisco evolved in temperate climates, not temperate means, you know, kind of moderate climate conditions. Um, but Rubisco actually doesn't work very well in harsh conditions like the desert. So if it's very dry or there's not very much CO2 in the atmosphere or both, because the desert typically has both issues, 
then Rubisco is not um, a very efficient enzyme under those conditions. And so scientists have long studied uh, additional adaptations that, especially uh, different enzymes, that function better in the Calvin cycle uh, than Rubisco. And so there are different variations and different adaptations in plants that live in the desert, for example, that, um, that allow them to survive in those conditions. And that makes sense. Um, so Rubisco would be the main um, enzyme uh, in the plants that, that we have around here. But if you go out into a super dry, super desolate area, you can still find some plant life, but those plants will depend on some other enzymes, in a, so usually in addition to Rubisco, um, that will help them deal with those specifically harsh environments.